this is all the books I read in June or started reading and decided I wasn't going to finish, which is quite a few this month. I've got 22 books to discuss, but 15 of them are reads and 8 of them are, 7 of them are DNFs. I can do maths. I've been a bit scattered this month and I've been reading the wrong sort of books and I've had to sort of readjust the sort of books that I was reading. So I think quite a few of these DNFs might have been a bit harsh. Well, I know I'm DNFing a lot this year, but this is just taking the piss. I think a few of these I might head back to because you have books on your radar, you want to get to them, but sometimes you just need to change gears and read something completely different and I took me way too long to realise that. One of these books that I might have to go back to is What Willow Says by Lynn Buckle. This is quite an ambient novel that somehow combines a bog and the children of the bog in like a mythological, in a mytholo mythological sense, I can say that word. But it's also this modern day story about a child with a disability and just sort of took a bit too long to get started and was quite a bit about setting. So I gave up on it. It is the sort of book that might not be for me, but also it, it, it definitely was DNF'd way too quickly. One thing that wasn't DNF'd quick enough was Ben Elton's Dead Famous. This is the story of like a Big Brother style reality TV show and a murder happens and there's cameras everywhere and surely you know who did the murder, but they don't and they have to investigate the murder and this is meant to be a comedy. Now, Ben Elton is famous for coming on to Blackadder after season one of Blackadder and turning it from what was actually a relatively middling poor sitcom into one of the modern classics, probably not so modern anymore, of British comedy in incredibly funny Rowan Atkinson and it launched the careers of Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie and there's so much, so much humour in that. I did have expectations of... Ben Elton, but these jokes were lazy. These jokes relied on like character stereotypes that weren't funny and felt offensive. Even if they weren't offensive, I'm just like, oh, this just feels offensive. It, it was just like cruel humor rather than ridiculous humor or funny humor or unexpected humor. I don't mind a little bit of cruel humor, but if that is your major, major thing, you, you've got to do better. This is, this is wiped off all future reading of Ben Elton from my TBR. I do not regret DNFing this book. I wish I did it sooner. I will not read another Ben Elton. Comedy writers, you have to produce jokes. They don't have to be many, but they have to exist. Still Life by Sarah Wynnum. This was quite an early DNF. It jumped around a little bit, but it was about E.M. Forster and this man called Evelyn, which I thought was Evelyn War. I've seen a few other reviews and it wasn't, and I just, I, I couldn't get into it. Evelyn Moore is a bit of a douchebag from what I can make out, and this character was a bit of a douchebag, and I didn't really want to be in the head of a douchebag. Maybe I was a bit harsh on this book. Maybe I wouldn't have liked it anyway, I don't know. Much more confident with my DNFing of Anthony Dawes' Cloud Cuckoo Land, however. This really reminded me of Cloud Atlas. You've got a story within a story within a story, and we're changing genres and, and I know that this will be controversial with some, some people, but David Mitchell did not do any one of those short stories any justice. They were all trash. It was just mediocrity into mediocrity. And this is exactly what uh, Cloud Cuckoo Land was feeling like. On top of that, there was a lot of changes of perspectives very quickly. And when you've got a high school shooting on one storyline and you're in the future in another storyline, and that's all meant to link together with some sort of ancient Greek textbook, it just, it was a mess. And I'm not interested in somebody showing me that they can write genres equally well as each other. It just, it felt like a very poor version of Cloud Atlas, which itself is not a very good book. I think that might upset a few people. <laughs> But Aquarium by Yah Shahari. This comes with the stonkingly high Goodreads average rating of 2.92. That's right, you can get them beginning with two. It's about a pair of twins who are deaf and 
how they experience the world and how the world discriminates against them. It was just so simple. It was sort of like making the point that the world discriminates against deaf people. Did you know? Come on. I just felt like this was pretty poorly written. Wise Children by Angela Carter. I've never read an Angela Carter before and I see the fascination with her. This book had this, I want to say like tipping the velvet style, you know, Sarah Waters historical fiction feel to it. It felt campy and silly. I just lost interest in it. And I had this on loan through, through Libby. I hadn't read it in the three weeks that I'd had it on loan. And, and to be fair to it, it, it did take me two weeks to actually get, get to it in the first place. And it was due in and I just didn't really care about it enough to renew my loan of it. It just didn't captivate me. It didn't give me a reason to want to keep reading it. It was just a bunch of weird campy fun. And that was it. Lastly, The Mothers by Britt Bennett. I just could not get into this book. This is another book that I will probably come back to later on. I don't really think that this is a good DNF. There's unwanted pregnancy going on. There's clearly going to be this storyline that is a bet around abortion or something. And I just could not get myself into this book. And I just think that this was uh, the right book at the wrong time. And it's a book that I will probably head back to later on. If you saw Nell's video on her channel, now if you don't know, Nell has a new channel where she's doing book reviews on her own. If you saw Nell's video on her channel, you probably have an idea of what was going on and what was going through my mind at the time. And focusing on hardcore literary fiction, not that I think Britt Bennett is hardcore literary fiction, but, you know, she is quite an emotionally driven author and I just needed a little bit simpler fiction. So hopefully you've got an idea of the books that I really don't recommend and the books that I maybe think that I need to reassess at a later date. Milkman by Anna Burns. This one, the Booker Prize uh, a few years ago, I think it was... 2017 might have been another year near that an Irish novel set in the troubles and Anna Burns does this really interesting thing with the character names it's always like second brother-in-law and almost boyfriend and milkman nobody's called Derek nobody's called Mary it managed to center our protagonist in the book with everybody known as their role in her life or as their relation to her. I thought it was a very effective tool for centering it on her experiences when quite a lot of the book is about these other characters. The role of women in Irish society at the time was clearly barked and the expectations on our main character are horrible but also the expectations on all the other characters but what was going on here felt, it felt third worldish. Let me put on my pig-headed colonial racist hat. It felt like this was like an African novel where corruption is normal, as opposed to in the West where corruption is not spoken about, but it's normal. Well, look, here it is. With all of this going on, it just didn't quite suck me in. And, and as was sort of said, maybe this is the wrong time for me to read this book. There's quite a lot of books. 2018 it won the Booker Prize. I am a bit of a magpie today, clearly. Lincoln in a Bardo won in 2017, I think. It just, it just failed to suck me in. And I think I probably read this book at the wrong time. Ultimately, this was actually one of the better books I read. And looking back and thinking about this book, I actually think that this is like a wonderful bit of literary try it's it's a it's a literary triumph really the way it's quite innovative and simple but effective i just i needed it to suck me in a bit more give me a few more breadcrumbs because i was a little bit distracted and uddled uh, so i only gave it three stars i think that may be incredibly harsh and i think that we're probably going to see a little bit of a theme here the colony by audrey mcgee now this is gaining a little bit of attention. A lot of people think that this will make the Booker Prize long list, including myself. An English painter goes to this remote Irish island during the time of the Troubles, and he's there just to get away from life and paint his paintings, but he's a real cantankerous, 
asshole of a man. Really quite unlikable. And I really feel like he is a representation for the English at the time of the troubles in this book. The island he goes to actually still speak predominantly Irish, but they speak English to this man. Our, our artist comes across a French linguist who is studying the decline of the Irish language and he's really angry that this Englishman is on the island speaking English because he can't speak Irish. A lot of the books focuses on this conflict between these two men. Then we have this young boy who wants to be a painter and offers to work for our painter and just really wants to get off the island and show the world that he's an incredible painter. At first, the Englishman's like, you're, you know, you're young, you know, I there's so many young people I see who think they can paint, nobody can paint, but he actually can paint. The relationship between this boy and this man, the sort of the master-apprentice sort of relationship. And the whole time you've got to remember that he's English and he's Irish. And then finally we have this boy's mother and the relationship that she has with the French linguist and the Irish artist. And then with the other men in the community. This novel manages to be anti-colonial, it manages to be feminist. And it manages to tie it all into the IRA and the Troubles. I think it's a very competent novel. I've given it four stars. But I think that while this has been predicted to be on the book a long list, I, I honestly believe that if this book gets the right set of judges, that this is a potential winner of the Booker Prize, it's whether it will win. I, I, I think it's probably even better than The Promise. So... Bitter Orange by Claire Fuller. I absolutely loved Unsettled Ground by Claire Fuller. I read it for the Woman's Prize last year. And I've not gotten to another Claire Fuller since. And she's an author that I definitely wanted to read more of. Unfortunately, Bitter Orange didn't work for me. It focuses on this woman who is about 40. She's a little bit overweight. She's not very confident. She moves into this like set of rooms in this mansion and she can see in her bathroom there's like a little hole in the floorboard and she can see through the hole to this couple below one of the first things she sees is the wife try to give the husband a hand job and the husband turn her down they become friends and there's this weird sexual tension between them and it's quite depressed and it sort of has a lot of themes that don't quite wrap together. I can see how this book is a stepping stone for Unsettled Ground. You can see lots of the themes in Unsettled Ground in Bitter Oranges, Bitter Orange rather, but they're just not well executed and they just don't come together and it's just one of these books that misses everything by small margins and as, as, a, as a result it's not a very good book but it's so nearly a very good book in so many respects it just doesn't just needed a little bit more time in the oven the dough's a bit uncooked and the cake hasn't risen enough love and virtue by diana reed i have a single book review out of this i really really liked this book this book focuses on Michaela, who is a first year student at a prestigious Sydney University. She comes from Canberra. Canberra is the capital of Australia. It's where all the politicians pass the laws, but it's not a very big city and it really only has parliament there, but it's the source of power within Australia. Then Sydney is obviously... Uh, I mean, as a Melbourne, and I don't want to say it's Australia's biggest city, but it's definitely in the top two, and it's got a slightly larger population than Melbourne. And she goes to university, and they're all like, it's this real frat mentality. Uh, it's got this real O-week feel to it, O-week. I don't know if O-week is an Australian term or, or not, but it, it's orientation week. It's basically a week where you go to university in first year, the, nobody else is there, just the first years. And if you live on university campus, you move in, you get orientated with where everything is, 
and you basically drink as much alcohol as you can and do as much dumb shit as you can and have sex with as many different people as you can and you know it's sort of like let's do schoolies again but just before we start university and she sort of partakes in that culture and she's raped and she has a friend and the way Michaela responds to the rape and the way Eve responds to the rape are very different. But also there is this idea of privilege within this book where we have Michaela who is quite a humble student there on a scholarship with all these very rich people who are there because they're rich. And then we go back to the Canberra thing because all of these people who are there, you know, taking advantage of drunk women and doing all the things that they really shouldn't are going to end up as Australia's next generation of politicians. There is a relationship with a university lecture thrown in. And I just think that this is a wonderfully complex novel. It, it is sort of in that Sally Rooney style, but it is so, so much more than Sally Rooney is doing. I just think it's an absolutely wonderful novel. The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. This is a huge book. It's a, like an intergenerational story that really focuses on the life of a black girl. But you sort of go back and you see older generations and, and, and all the things that led up to her life. This was an interesting book. I'm glad I read it. I didn't hate it, but it did just feel like a list of issues that Honoré Jeffers wanted to to discuss they wanted to put it in and cross it off and move on to the next one and while these are all the issues facing the african american people at the moment it didn't have any glue it didn't really get linked together i definitely think that this is a book written for black people so white people reading it probably need to maybe understand that they're not the target audience and not do exactly what i'm doing and say that it was a bit of an average book cold enough for snow by jessica Ayu. this is a story about an australian japanese woman and her mother and they travel to tokyo together and they share a meal and they go shopping and a lot of this book takes place as a sort of a flashback as the daughter is remembering things the the language in this book is really the star of it it's just such a wonderfully ambient novel that it feels like a blanket just warm and fuzzy and really envelops you in the setting and the scene but there's not a lot else to it there's no real meat to sink your teeth in this is just nice language nice setting it feels like the perfect book as like a, a headache cure but it's not really my sort of book and I've, I've given it three stars i definitely i've seen good reviews for this and and i definitely want to give you the heads up that while i'm giving it an average review i know that there are other people out there that would absolutely love this book if you like a little bit of a a slow paced book where not a lot happens then you might you might love this this book you know, you've got to appreciate the book for what it's doing and what this book is doing and what I enjoy are different things. But I, th I think this is wonderfully well done at, at the things that it is doing. And I didn't hate reading it. Brown Girls by Daphne Pallari Andreas. It's more of like an essay, really, about all the different sort of experience that happen to brown girls. Brown girls who are you know, different shades of brown, who are different sexualities, who live in different locations, who have different socioeconomic means, who are treated differently, their relationship with boys, their relationship with girls, their, their relationship to sex, their relationship uh, not with sex, their relationship to spending and exploitation and housing. It, it had a huge scope and not enough words to do it in. I think that this book is really just a love letter to brown girls saying, I see you. The intimate, in, in, I just can't say this word. The intimate, the in, it, the inim, inimitable, inimitable, the inimitable Jeeves by P.G. Wodehouse. Why does my tongue refuse to like do that? P.G. Wodehouse. If you don't know who P.G. Wodehouse is, get some P.G. Wodehouse. P.G. Wodehouse is most famous for the Jeeves novels, the Jeeves and Worcester novels. Jeeves is a, 
a valet, a servant, a butler. He's not a butler. It's There's a difference between a butler and a valet. Worcester is a very w rich and wealthy man. Jeeves is very intelligent. Worcester thinks he's very intelligent, but is somewhat lacking in the upstairs department. Has lots of really quaint and weird sayings. And essentially, this is a bit of a piss take of the bourgeoisie. And it's just written in this... Nobody puts one word after the other quite like P.G. Wodehouse. It just... It flows so nicely in such a... He's such a talented writer. And he's just writing these silly little comedy novels. I mean, obviously, he's dead now. This is written almost 100 years ago. And it's based in, I don't know, the Between the World Wars. This book is a, a series of short stories, and they're all interconnected, and it really focuses on Worcester's friend, Bingo Little, who falls in love at a drop of a hat. And Bingo is forever falling in love, needing to get engaged to a woman who he wants to marry, and has to find a way to get his uncle to increase his allowance so that he can afford to marry this woman and not work. I mean, who would work? And gets Jeeves to help him with all of his plans. Now, Jeeves is not always the benevolent fellow that you think he is. He often has his own motives for doing things. Sometimes they're just as simple as burning those ugly pair of socks that Worcester purchased. But Jeeves and Worcester are just delightful and this series is just one of my go-tos when I, I just I need to turn it down and read something a bit lighter and a bit more fun and I, I find them therapeutic. They're funny. They're absolutely stupid and delightful. A Long Way From Delula by Max Lobe. This is a Cameroonian novel. It is about a boy who runs away from home and wants to become a football star. His brother runs after him with his friend. I must confess that what was going on in this novel took me way too long to like twig and figure it out. And when I did, I was like, oh my God, how did you not? A kind of a really beautiful novel about friendship and relationship within Cameroon and also this desire to travel to Europe. While while this is focusing on football, I think that there is generally a desire to leave Africa, to go to Europe, to the well-paying jobs and, and that sort of thing, like the, the promised land sort of thing, which... But honestly, the relationships between these characters and how the society works. I thought this was great. I've given it four stars. I think it's a really good book. Glory by No Violet Bulawayo. This was pitched to me as Animal Farm, but make it African. I think that that's a bad description of it. I think that it is more what would Orwell have written if he was a Zimbabwean woman who was 40 and wanted to write Animal Farm but was alive right now. And it's a different novel, but you know, we still have horses that are running countries and parrots that are doing things. It gives it this bizarre simplicity. It's, I mean, Animal Farm is such a good book and it is so simple in its message and what it is doing. What I've never really realized about this book is why we've used anthropomorphized animals in it to demonstrate the points. And now when you compare it to Glory and you see a second book doing it, it really does simplify things. It really does take away a lot of the superficial dressing that is in other books to really get to the core of the issue. And the core of the issue is corruption within this fictional African country, Jadata, with a da and another da. What a, what a ridiculous way to say your country. This is the thing about this book, is that while we are exploring this corruption and the sexism and misogyny and racism and classism and violence and all the horrific, horrible shit that's happening. This book manages to be hilarious. This is the funniest book I have read this year. Because you're not expecting it, and it's so witty and so funny. I can't believe that, like, this is a sort of, this is clever dystopian novel, and I'm recommending it for the lols. 
it's a good book regardless of whether you laugh or not. But the humour in it really elevates it for me, and it's a five-star read. The Fell by Sarah Moss. This is a story of a woman who is sort of locked up uh, in the COVID restrictions. She's a close contact. She's not allowed to leave her house, and she's going a bit... She's really struggling with not being allowed out of her house, and she goes for a walk, and she twists her ankle or breaks her ankle. We don't quite know what she's done, but she's hurt herself, and she's incapable of getting back home. She has a teenage son, and he's not really sure what to do. She, you know, she's a single mother, really struggling with the income to live and facing with this huge fine that is the equivalent of like a year's worth of her income if she's caught leaving the house. And she's left the house and she's broken the rules. It creates this really weird and cool discussion around the sort of the vitriol of doing everything you can right and always wearing a mask and all that with the responsibilities that you have. I almost think it was sort of examining the common sense of these rules. I mean, obviously the the COVID lockdown rules, everybody had the same problem that they, they came so quickly and I don't think that there was a lot of thought in any of these rules and things weren't done well anywhere but it definitely created this debate and argument and conflict that really didn't need to happen. I think this really captivates this idea of kindness and you need to do nice for all people even if you don't agree with them is the ultimate message of this novel and I think it's quite a nice well done novel. It's not perfect so I'm going to give it four stars but I think it's a worthwhile read. Basically if, I, if we're going to talk about COVID I'm sort of like oh I'm so out of it. I just couldn't care. I find it the most asinine topic ever but this didn't focus on the things that I found boring about it. It didn't focus on the tedious. It didn't. It wasn't saying the same stuff. So, so I think that Sarah Moss needs to be really congratulated for writing a COVID novel that isn't paint dry boring. Fruit of the Drunken Tree by Ingrid Rojas Contras. I did this as a buddy read with Deborah from Book In with Deborah. And now, if you haven't subscribed to Deborah, watch her videos. Give her a subscribe. Good booktuber, great booktuber, does a lot of reading around all over the place, sort of different cultures, trying to read a book, trying to read a book from every different country, reads a lot of historical fiction, literary fiction, classics, just, you know, a good range. I am sure that if you're watching me, you will find something that you like in Deborah's taste in books. I'm really glad I did this as a buddy read because I was not into this book. I was really struggling. I'm like, there's too many, there's too many themes, there's too many things going on. There's this stuff, I don't trust anything. I don't know whether our narrator is reliable. There's this drunken tree that makes you see things. What's going on? I'm not sure. And then at the end, it all comes together and it's so crystal clear. And the book is so much simpler than I was giving it credit for. And it was so much better than I realised. It just needed it to, to come together. And, and doing it as a buddy read uh, kept me in there. And it, it really paid off this time. You know, I, I, I will DNF a buddy read. But I want to be a little bit more certain. I'm, I'm happy to casually DNF a book and be wrong about it later on. And read it and, and have it be a five star read. I don't want to like do that in a in a buddy read. I, I want to be sure that I'm not enjoying the book. And I was just sort of a bit, what's, I don't know. I haven't really said anything about the book, I'm sorry. This is a, about Columbia. This is about these two girls and their mother and this young girl who comes to work for them. It just focuses on the lives of these four women, how the society is mistreating them and how they are used and abused and pawns in Colombia's game. And this is really quite a brutal novel. There's a lot of Pablo Escobar and the drug trade in this. There's kidnapping, there's gang rape. There's a lot of stuff that is maybe not to everybody's tastes. It's quite, quite a few trigger warnings for this. And then ultimately it also focuses on the immigrant experience, which you know from the very beginning. I think this is a very, very well done Colombian novel about the brutality of life in Colombia. Sweet Days of Discipline 
by Fleur Jaggi. Jaggi? This is an Italian novel translated, it's not a novel, it's a novella rather, about this girl who is going to boarding school, her relationship with the girls around her and particularly this one girl and also her relationship with her parents. This is a book way above my pay grade. I, I am not smart enough for this book. There's definitely sapphic tones in this book but there's also Lolita tones in this book too. Incest tones. These girls going to this boarding school sort of lack that paternal and maternal figures and the building of relationships are quite broken and these girls come out quite broken. The way they interact with people is almost getting, like it's not, but it's sort of getting towards Lord of the Flies territory. There's something really wrong with it and it's very subtle. This is a book for the brainy brains out there. Um, it's too many pieces and I couldn't put it together. Also, while this is translated from the Italian, there's lots of German and French in it. And I don't speak German or French. I can identify a couple of basic phrases. I'm much better at French than I am at German. And so I didn't really have a lot of difficulty reading the French, but the German was Greek to me, which is the wrong language. I mean, I'm sure the expectation is that you would know that sort of stuff, but I didn't. I think this was about 70 pages and it took me about a week to read. It's very, very dense. I just, I like I'd read two or three pages and be like, that's it, I'm done with this one, next book. But I definitely think there's a market for it, especially, look, there's a lot of booktubers out there that are more intelligent than me. You know who you are. It needs to find the right audience. It needs to find people like Roz from Scally Dandling about the books. You should read this one, Roz. Washington Black by Essie Ed Yuang. This is a story about a slave in Barbados and he is the slave of a, a very brutal and horrible man who essentially trades this slave to his brother who is a nice man, except he's still white and it focuses on this relationship. Uh, and this man educates our slave and gets him to work on a thing called a cloud cutter, which I get the, it sounds very much like a hot air balloon to me. And they go on an expedition and he abandons him and gives him his freedom. And the whole time he doesn't really know why he's abandoned. This was a very bad book in the end. It just didn't, it didn't come together. I, I wasn't sure why anything was happening other than I don't want to be killed by this slaver. I didn't really get any of the motivations for our protagonist. Oh, I couldn't even think of the name of the protagonist. It's the title of the book. His name's Wash. Washington Black. George Washington Black. I mean, it's how much of an impression this one's made. You know when you're reading a book and, you, and there's not long left of the book, you know that you're, you're, things have been resolved and you're like, this just feels like more scene building. I'm still waiting for things to happen. This is this is just more set up and you're just gonna finish and I'm gonna be like, well, what was that? And that's, that's what this book was. I could sort of see it coming. It just really was a complete disappointment. Upright Women Wanted, Sarah Gailey. This is just a light Western. It's gay as fuck. And it's about librarians who kill people in the Wild West. It's a really light, novel despite it being an incredibly short book i felt like it could have even been shorter i feel like sarah gailey had this cool idea for a world and then couldn't really put a story in the story was fine it was what i wanted to read at the time it was what i needed to read it was it was just an enjoyable piece of fluff to be completely honest there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes we need enjoyable fluff. I think that's what it intends to do, and it's quite good at what it intends to do. But it's certainly not going to be a book that I remember for, for long. There are all the books I read for the month. Have you read any of these books? Should I reread any of the ones I DNF'd? Was I too mean to any of them? And are you looking forward to reading any of them? Let me know in the comments, and let me know what your best read of the month was. Bye-bye.